During Giuseppe Verdi's 60-year composing career, he wrote several operas, including La Traviata, Il Trovatore, Don Carlo, and Falstaff, a Requiem Mass, chamber music, sacred pieces, and over 25 art songs. As Barbara Rossano Hanning explained in Concise History of Western Music, quote, Verdi took more time to compose than his predecessors, and he used that time to calculate the most effective setting to enhance an opera's dramatic impact on the audience, end quote. For this and many other reasons, I have so enjoyed learning Verdi's arias. And a few years ago, I started to look more closely at his art songs. These pieces are shorter in duration, have narrow vocal ranges or tessituras for the most part, but they are filled with the drama that Verdi worked into his opera arias. Verdi takes experiences in life, heartbreak, hopelessness, yearning, passion, and joy, and he uses the power of the human voice and his own personal style of text setting, rhythmic energy, and dynamic contrast to bring drama to the art song, inviting the listener to feel the pain, fury, or joy with the singer. These are mini masterpieces, telling in-depth stories and expressing complex feelings and ideas. Now, few scholars have paid much attention to Verdi's art songs, briefly mentioning them in passing. Carol Kimball, for example, explains in the book Song, A Guide to Art Song Style and Literature, that Verdi's art songs at this time, much like Rossini, Donizetti, and Bellini, were written for the amateur singers for private performance. She says, quote, most of these songs retain operatic elements and are comparable to miniature arias with fluid, graceful melodies and even cadenzas and embellishments. But because they were created for a specific arena of performance, there was little thought of fusion of poem and musical elements beyond a certain point." End quote. Well, what is that point? These pieces are packed with passion and beauty challenging vocal passages and interesting use of text setting, rhythms, and dynamic contrast to convey messages and stories to audiences. How do we know that Verdi didn't intend these pieces for a larger performance venue? And why not look at them now for performance and teaching? In my book, The Art Songs of Giuseppe Verdi, a catalog of texts and a musicological analysis, I discuss the historical background, text, poet, melody, harmony, form, accompaniment, and text setting of 26 of Verdi's art songs. Some are better suited for the mature singer. Others can easily be approached by college-age singers. Some are two minutes in length, while others are considered concert arias with contrasting sections. Many of Verdi's art songs share similarities with one or more of Verdi's arias, and others seem to mimic another composer's setting of the same text. These art songs, including the ones you'll hear today, are valuable musical contributions that deserve a place on a recital program or in a student's repertoire. So let's get down to business. As I mentioned, Verdi uses dramatic text setting, rhythmic changes, and dynamic contrast to tell stories and convey emotions in effective and beautiful ways. Those three elements will be our focus today. Let's start with an aria to form a foundation. Pace, pace, o mio Dio, is really a prayer for peace as Leonora grieves. It also functions as a review of the story from Leonora's point of view. Verdi uses rising and falling dynamics, legato text setting, and simple accompaniment as a backdrop for Leonora to tell of her love of Elvaro, the cruelty of her situation, and the hopelessness of her future. With little interruption in the phrases, she seems in complete control of her emotions. She has been hidden away in this convent for quite a while, and she has lived with these feelings and memories. Suddenly, about two-thirds of the way through the piece, she calls out to God one more time with an octave leap down from B-flat 5. This is one last attempt at finding peace. In addition to these interesting text settings, there is a consistent triplet arpeggio accompaniment throughout the piece. This represents the long line of thought and pain that Leonora feels. Her inner monologue, if you will. It doesn't stop through the whole piece until the very end when she is interrupted in her prayer.
Now, the singer must be careful with that B-flat-5 that appears two-thirds of the way through the piece. While it is a climactic moment, Verdi has placed a pianissimo marking on the high note, conveying that even in all her sadness, Leonora is completely in control, or so she thinks. Now, this drastic change that I just mentioned in the aria takes place near the end when Leonora hears her brother and Alvaro battling. She is not aware of who is fighting, but she is aware of the presence of others in her place of worship and prayer and she considers it blasphemy. At that moment, she loses control, the tempo becomes allegro, and the accompaniment changes to a series of tremolo. Leonora finishes her aria with the curse, Maledizione, on those who have entered her sanctuary. The final curse appears on the tonic, but the chromatic tremolo and harmonic progression in the accompaniment continue the dissonance, delaying closure. Remember that the first high B flat in the piece occurs on the word pace, or peace, and is marked pianissimo. Well, the second high B flat is marked fortissimo and occurs on the word curse. This juxtaposition of peace and curse on the tonic reminds the listener what Leonora desires and what is her actual reality. She may be cursing others, but she herself is cursed as well, never to find peace again.
Now that we've heard an aria to establish a foundation of Verdi's compositional style, let's look at an art song for comparison. Perduta o la pace is an art song that has text that is an Italian translation by Balestra of Franz Schubert's Gretchen und Spinnrad. Now, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe's story of Faust is about a man who sells his soul to the devil so he can receive all he wants on earth. He uses that power to seduce a much younger woman, Gretchen. In this scene, she is working at the spinning wheel, obsessively thinking of Faust. Just like Schubert repeated minor ru ist hin several times throughout his piece, Verdi returns to perduta, or lost, many times. This statement is so integral to the character. She has lost her peace and has a thousand woes. Near the end of the song, much like Schubert's version, there is a climax on the word bacha, or kiss. The character is so enraptured that the idea of kissing the man she loves makes her crazy. To further convey the mental instability of the singer, Verdi changes the tonality of the piece from minor to major to minor again. Now most of this piece sits in the middle of a soprano's range. Singers should recognize the challenge of singing this piece without getting too fatigued and, and still preparing and successfully stretching for the high climactic moments. Of further interest, the lowest pitch in the piece doesn't appear until the last note on the word moria, or death. Schubert's piano pattern imitates the sound of the spinning wheel that Gretchen is using in the Gretchen am Spinnrad art song. pattern to mimic a heartbeat. The singer's heartbeat increases with each new section as she explores her feelings and starts to lose it, <laughs> bringing the music and the mood to a climax, and then returning to some semblance of calm on the repeated text. When the singer is describing a new aspect of her obsession, her love, the object of her love, and the desires she has, the singer can choose to crescendo and speed up to show the growing energy and obsession of the singer, and then return to that calm on the perduta o la pace. Thank you. 
Let's return to one of Verdi's arias. Ritorno vincitor appears in Aida, and this aria takes place right after the army has heading off to war. You'll hear in the piano the march-like theme that suddenly arrives at the aria. Aida starts with an impassioned and distressed cry. She is torn between the love of her father and of Radames. Verdi portrays this through quick succession of words, varying ranges, and accents in the piano, or orchestra. <laughs> For example, on the words Victor over my father, Aida sings in the lower part of her range and then leaps up on the word father, almost as if she's asking herself how she could betray her father. Vincitor del Padre mio. As the piece continues, Aida alternates between long and short ascending and de descending phrases, slowly rising through her range. The lack of melodic stability and legato shows how she is mentally and emotionally unstable, feeling crazy in her circumstances. It comes to a head when Aida cries out on a high B flat and then descends an octave and a fifth while singing, ah, unhappy me, what have I said? At this point, the music becomes slower and melancholic with minor leaps while Aida sings, starting with, and my love? start the sacred names of father, of lover. She doesn't know who to support, who to mourn, or where to turn. The orchestra helps to illustrate this point through a repeated chromatic triplet pattern that switches between the bass and treble clefs. essence of prayer for defeat of the other. What an impossible situation. Lost and aching, Aida sings the final words of the piece, a prayer to the gods for pity. Gods, have pity on my suffering, is sung on one large ascending and descending passage. This final rise and fall is Aida's final cry for mercy. The accompaniment becomes sparse and the vocal line is broken up, perhaps to show the character's breathlessness and defeat. The final word, suffering, is sung on a C natural with an A-flat major chord under the voice. This return to major may hint a peace, mercy, and resolution. But sadly, anyone who knows the author knows that her story's resolution doesn't come. Like Perduca o la Pace, the singer feels like she's losing her mind. She's confused by her thoughts and her feelings. Both pieces have large leaps in the vocal line, which give the feelings of mental instability and crying out. Perduta has a smaller range than Aida's aria, but the drama is still as palpable. Verdi uses the orchestral accompaniment to support the voice in telling the story. Accents, loud tremolos, and chromatic passages help to further the feeling of the singer being lost because it makes it hard to feel the peace of a downbeat or a consistent home key. As you will hear, there is a lot of dynamic contrast in this work. As Aida goes back and forth in her loyalties, there are crescendos and decrescendos that create a sense of rising and falling waves of emotion. In the final section of the piece, The Prayer to the Gods, the accompaniment is a series of tremolos, however, with a much lower dynamic level and different harmonies. These tremolos are less frenzied than the early ones. Sadness and hopelessness take over where craze and fury left off. Padre 
these art songs discuss today, Ave Maria is the least known or performed. Though it is a chamber work composed for voice and strings and not strictly an art song, it can easily be performed as an art song and highlights Verdi's compositional style. Many people know the Schubert setting, as well as the Gounod Bach setting. Ave Maria with drama in mind, not just the sacred. Schubert and Gounod used the accompaniment as background for the singer so that the focus would be on the words of the prayer. The vocal lines are simple and smooth, but Verdi sets his Ave Maria for the singer to convey more overt passion and personalized expression of the words through inflection and rubato. Verdi uses the Italian translation instead of the more common Latin text, he begins the piece as a prayer with the repeated pitch in varying rhythms that mimics natural speech, almost chant-like. The line grows in volume and soars up a fifth on the words, Are you blessed? This feels like a moment of awakening within the prayer, when the words sink in and the singer relates to the text instead of just reciting it. The melody, rhythm, and accompaniment become more interesting and varied at this point, bringing out the importance of certain ideas presented in the text. When the singer asks Mary to protect him or her from evil, there is a descending line which then leaps up on the words, Christ Jesus. of the singer's thoughts. Blessed God and Christ are set in ascending motion, while guard us from evil and to live here below are set to descending musical lines. Now, the exception to this lies in the last line of the piece. The final pray for us to God contains a large leap down. <laughs> the singer's desire for Mary and God to reach down and deliver him or her. The piece ends much like it begins. The Ave Maria closes with a repeated tonic chord in the accompaniment and silence and peace in the voice. All written dynamics in this piece are quite low. <laughs> Crescendos occur leading into both utterances of Benedetta or Blessed. Verdi brings out this word both in pitch and dynamic accent. But as the piece ends, accompaniment is marked pianissimo, which creates a feeling of the peace and stillness that the prayer will bring.
Let's turn our attention to another famous Ave Maria composed by Verdi. Salce Salce is from the opera Otello, sung by Desdemona. It is important to note that the 1880 Ave Maria as that you just heard and the Othello Ave Maria have been compared often, with some scholars suggesting that the art song acted as a starting off point for the opera aria. However, as George Martin confirms in his book Aspects of Verdi, according to dates of letters between Verdi and his publisher Ricordi, they were two quite different compositions with two quite different aims. Desdemona's prayer was written as a very personal Ave Maria in the midst of the drama of Othello. The 1880 Ave Maria was written earlier and was often paired with Verdi's Pater Noster and suitable for, for, for performance in any sacred or recital setting. The beginning sections of the piece are made up of moments of Desdemona bemoaning her sadness interspersed with song lyrics of an old song she remembers. Desdemona is in her bedroom with her chambermaid, Emilia. Desdemona knows her husband, Othello, is going to kill her. She is thinking back to her youth and remembering her mother's servant, Barbara, who was betrayed and left by a lover. Desdemona remembers Barbara's sadness and how she would sing this song about the willow, and this is the theme. <laughs> used to sing, the melody sweeps upward and settles back down slowly through the phrase. The same pitches are repeated several times in this section over sparse accompaniment, divided by moments of silence, as Desdemona half-heartedly sings the song, remembering Barbara's pain and then getting lost in her own. She interrupts herself to tell Amelia to go get her wedding gown for Desdemona to wear and to hold on to Desdemona's wedding ring. Then again, when she hears a noise, she asks Amelia to see who is knocking at the door. These moments of interruption are quite different musically from the song Desdemona has been singing, adding to the drama of the interruption. At any of these moments, Othello could return. Dynamics come into play here as well. While Aida's aria is mostly large and loud throughout, this piece is mostly wistful and mezzo forte throughout. When that line is broken by recit or by Desdemona's crime, the words and expression are accentuated by a drastic change. For example, when Desdemona hears someone at the door, the accompaniment grows in volume while Desdemona asks Amelia who is at the door. Her fear is expressed through the loud tremolo in the orchestral accompaniment. Also, when Desdemona is telling Amelia goodbye, she knows it's for the last time. The soft accompaniment is broken by a loud cry in the voice and rich harmonies in the orchestra as she tells Amelia farewell. There are countless more points to discuss, but of greatest interest in this discussion of Verdi is the Ave Maria that ends the Sari. This Ave Maria is Verdi's most famous, surpassing the Salve Maria from I Lombardi and the art song, art song excuse me, of 1880. As you can see, the words are also different from the art song we discussed and the traditional Latin. Verdi begins both these pieces with the recitation of prayer, with a repeated pitch in varying rhythms that mimics chant. Both settings start with a call to Mary and a description of her grace and blessedness. Then the texts branch off into prayers of supplication. As Martin discusses in his book, in Desdemona's prayer, she asks Mary to pray on behalf of her husband, Othello, who is powerful and miserable, and for Desdemona, who kneels in adoration before you and is innocent, weak, and oppressed and whose head is bowed in injustice and wicked fate. This is a very personal prayer, specific to Desdemona, with specific references, excuse me, not the traditional text. Musically, the two settings of Ave Maria share some elements. Firstly, both are accompanied by strings, some of them muted. The Otello prayer begins on a solitary repeated E flat four, much like the 1880 Ave Maria repeated at sharp four. As Desdemona comes to the phrase, pray for us always in the hour of our death, the melody falls and returns to an E flat four where the piece began. The result is a sense of closure, of Desdemona's acceptance of her fate. But then, she ascends to an E flat and octave higher with the words pray for us repeated three times, almost like she's crying out again. Desdemona descends to another E flat and repeats Hail Mary in the hour of our death. 
While the orchestral accompaniment settles and gently repeats the willow theme, there is a sense that the piece could end at any moment. Then Desdemona sings an ascending A-flat major arpeggio on the words hail, creating a sense of Desdemona's plea reaching toward heaven itself. The high A-flat could ring for several beats, leaving the listener holding his or her breath. Amen happens on an octave and a half lower on that same E-flat, but the accompaniment carries an A-flat for many measures until the close of the piece on an A-flat major chord, resulting in musical openness in terms of space and a suggestion of an open fit, but closure in terms of returning to the tonic. Thank you. 
Verdi's most famous song about wine is the Libiamo from the first act of La Traviata. In similar fashion, the piece you're about to hear was written in triple meter, and both works contain large jumps at the start of each melody line that are then filled in through the rest of the phrase. and the second version employs the same tactic. All three drinking songs are dance-like and energetic. Libiano has a much simpler bass line in the orchestration than the Brindisi's complex and thick accompaniment. In the eight years between the creation of Brindisi and La Traviata, perhaps Verdi decided to simplify one voice to accentuate the other. Here's the Libiano. Pretty simple. <laughs> and here is the Brindisi. Returns several times. The next section changes to a more legato, lyrical melody line with the words, I have loved, consumed by two fatal eyes. The singer seems to have had some wine, become more relaxed, and fallen into the memory of a past love that could not be trusted. With a quick succession of 16th notes and the words, folly of youth, illusionary fantasy, the melody picks up in tempo and excitement, and give me the wine, joy of the heart returns. The piece feels like it slows down and stretches once again. The text is, the friend, the lover with time flees, but you do not fear that which destroys all. You is the wine. And the singer is saying that wine does not fear love. Wine seems to be braver than the singer. Once again, the line gains excitement with a line of 16th notes on the text. Old age does not offend you, but increases your value. Wine is not afraid to age, unlike the singer. Perhaps age is offensive because of the knowledge gained throughout life or the worry that life will not be as full and exciting in old age. The melody then returns to an earlier tune, creating the effect of a return to a dreamy moment, longing for a past love introduced near the beginning. The words faded as April and fall in the roses remind the audience that things fade and die. But once again, this drives into the central musical theme and the words, you are that which brings back the joy that was. Give me the wine joy of the heart. No matter how bad or faded life gets, wine makes it better. A singer may choose to stretch the next section out of time. Who better heals the heart of its wounds? The accents and the music fall on unstressed syllables in the words, on the words, excuse me. If the performer chooses to slow down the part of the, this part of the piece, as you will hear I do, the resulting feel is dance-like but a little tipsy. Perhaps the wine has started to affect the singer. As the piece comes to a close, the main theme returns, the tempo picks up once more, and the singer goes out with the tribute to wine, you, life of the senses, joy of the heart. The singer may choose to stretch the ending to give a final flourish or drive right through to the end. Either way, this art song is a fun, lighthearted, and playful tribute to wine. An interesting aspect of both versions is that Verdi, excuse me, both versions of the Brindisi, is that Verdi chooses to accent the rhythmic offbeat and the unstressed syllable of many words. This is playful and exciting. Each return to that central theme I mentioned is driven by a 16th note run in the accompaniment which shakes the singer back into the moment and out of his or her dream. Thank <laughs> you. 